for that going. So um, we're going to get into uh, healing here. I just want to tell you a brief history for it from my life and uh, preach what I'm feeling to mainly and focus on God's will and character for healing. So before praying for people, it's good to uh, grow faith and faith grows through the word, through the word of God. So we're going to uh, preach it here a bit. Sometimes, uh, at least in my life a lot, I've had to uh, untwist or unravel the lies I've believed in the past in order to receive the things of God. So uh, there's a lot of lies spoken in the area of God's will to heal. So we're going to try to unravel some lies and grow faith before we pray for people. So um, anyways, for myself, I grew up like my dad was a Pentecostal, was a preacher in a Pentecostal church. And uh, so uh, I... There was a belief in healing in the Pentecostal stream, but I never actually like saw someone get you know, prayed for and healed. Uh, but when I was a teenager, I played a ton of basketball up in Vail Mountain, BC. There's nothing to do in life other than maybe finding drugs or sports is kind of your option. So I chose sports to get addicted to, uh, which anyways, I was always shooting hoops and I messed up my shoulder. And so um, it was like always a chronic pain from shooting too many hoops. And so uh, I knew that it, it had in my mind that God heals. And so uh, I would go to bed at night and I'd be like, God, please heal my shoulder. I ask this in Jesus' name. And then I'd be like, and I remember like praying for my shoulder and testing and nobody showed me to do that, but I just knew that you should test it right away. So I do that. And for years, I, I never got healed. But not a single point did I question if it was God's will to heal or not, or his goodness on healing, or if that's part of his character. I always knew he wanted to heal, and I would, uh, from time to time, I'd persevere in praying for myself. Even though I never encountered any healing, uh, I just knew that was something that was my only go-to, because then I, we went to get scans, MRC, MR, not Hi. MRCs, MRI. MRAs. MRIs, <laughs> and then we got all those M's going, and uh, they they just said it looks totally normal. There's nothing wrong. So you go down every road, all you got left is God. And so how I got healed in my shoulder was actually uh, interesting. Is I just stopped playing basketball. <laughs> I got healed. So uh, I don't believe it was God's will for me to um, spend my whole life throwing a pigskin through a hoop. I uh, probably didn't do anything for the kingdom of God, for the gospel, for saving souls from hell. And so I thank him, I thank him that I got unplugged from that. And uh, that, uh, this, was, that this uh, problem led me back uh, to his, more of his will in my life. So I uh, thank God for how he used that messed up shoulder to unplug him from basketball. And, you know, the saying, ball is life. That's what basketball players say, you know. How is that your whole life to shooting little pigs? So that was, uh, didn't get healed until I just quit that habit. Now, uh, next was I was a tree planter up in northern BC with a bunch of like hippies and uh, and all kinds of people that end up in the bush up in northern BC. And I, I went, uh, in my third year planting, I went out and planted some trees, about uh, 2,000 that day. Walked away feeling pretty good, and then when I get to the cook shack, I find out there was a first year planter, like we called them rookies, and he had planted more trees than me that day. And then we, I, my buddy and I, we were so ticked off. We're our third year, we're supposed to be the highest ranking tree planters, making tons of money. This first year planter made more money than us. We're like, tomorrow we're going crazy. <laughs> and so the next day, literally in eight hours, we planted 4,400 trees, and my wrists were literally like this at the end of the day, and it was like creaking of a door when I go like this. This is called uh, tendonitis, and it was very severe. So in the past, when I had that, it'd take like probably at least three weeks of resting to let that heal. I couldn't even pick up a mug at the, at the cook shop at night. It was so uh, destroyed my wrist. So I get in my tent that night, and I had actually been walking away from God now for a few years, but I just knew, hey, my only hope out in the middle of the bush is God. So. Interesting how he uses uh, problems and life sicknesses, diseases to push us to him. So I'm reading the Psalms that night, and then I just say, God, would you please heal my wrists? I know I know I'm not serving you, but would you just do it anyways? So nothing happened that night, but when I woke up the next morning, it was freaky. When I uh, I just got up out of my tent, and I go to grab my shovel to work for the day, and when I grabbed my shovel, I was like, whoa, that is crazy. Wow. 
and it was like my wrists were like 85 percent better like it was in the past when i would have had that injury it would have taken weeks and i was just like really amazed so that was my first encounter with healing and what it did for me is it actually started to make me uh go back towards God in life. Like, so healing is a very powerful tool God uses to draw us back to him. So he had mercy on me. I didn't deserve to be healed, but he, he did that. And that was the beginning of a wake up for me. So um, anyways, so a few years after that, I finally surrendered back to the Lord. It took like my dad's whole body full of cancer, seeing death in my face. And I was like, uh, a lot of shakeups. I started with meeting Holy Spirit filled believers who would tell me miracle stories. And I was like, I've never met people like this. And anyway, so I got transformed 10 years ago. And then uh, for about two years, I was sharing the gospel with people. Everywhere I went, I was just wanted to share uh, the gospel. I was like, man, what he's done to me, I want to tell everyone. But I was running to these walls of unbelief with people. I share the gospel in the most epic way, just precise, just bam, just, you know. And But they just still wouldn't believe. I debate with a Buddhist woman for an hour. And at the end of the hour, we're just debating in circles as we walked in circles. And she didn't believe. And I was like, there's something missing. So why are people not believing? And so I realized I studied Jesus and saw what he did. And the difference between him and I is I just used words and he used power. Words and power, right? So he would heal the sick. Uh, at the back there, we've got a bunch of uh, books of Mark, the book of Mark that we've printed off. So you can, when you go today, take some and their gospel seeds to plant. But in the book of Mark, you look, I just studied Jesus. What did he do versus me? And his, his life looked very different than mine. He would heal the sick. He would cast out demons. Uh, so in Mark 1 alone, in Mark 1, right away, he's casting out a demon and he's healing the sick. And uh, so he walked in this power ministry. And I was like, I just believe that that's possible. I've heard of other people that do these things, pray for a sick person to get healed. And I was like, I just know that God would uh, want to use me in that area. But I had no clue how to grow in that. Like, I was like, I want to see someone healed. And they really want to hear what you have to say then if they got healed, right? So I was like, I want to see other people healed. So I started down a journey of reading all kinds of books about healing. and uh, But I just would hit a wall and not understanding. And there must be some magic, uh, magic thing out there. I'm just not understanding. And so um, one... I finally got uh, to one point at which I, I heard a teaching where a guy talked about God's will for healing. And that really awoke me to, uh, to strip away some lies I was believing. So uh, that's what I'm going to teach tonight. Uh, there's a, a whole bunch of concepts on healing that he had to free me from, but that was the one big one is God's will to heal. So we're going to get into that tonight. And what I want you to know is that this is not just for the uh, anointed special pastor you know, evangelists to do, but it's for all believers can walk in any gift of the Holy Spirit. You know, some people here might really feel a drawing towards healing more than others, or you might feel like that's more of your main gifting, but every person can operate in any gifting as the need arises, as you're at the bus stop and that guy's got a broken knee, you know. So we want to equip all believers to be able to heal the sick, and so I just want a couple stories from just average every day. Well, they're more than average they're very special believers but uh who wants to go first here you both come up but i just say you know god wants to use the everyday average believer to heal the sick i'm trying to think when this was this is my wife yes hi i'm jasmine <laughs> <laughs> um this probably about maybe five years ago now uh, there's this lady that i see in she waxes my eyebrows. That's how I know her. <laughs> and um, she she had done a sun run with her daughter the day before I saw her. And usually I go into her and I'm like, oh, hi, Mindy, how are you doing? She's like, oh, Jocelyn, how are you? Just like, she's very, very talkative. Um, but I knew that when I walked in there, she was much quieter and there was something off. And there was, so, you know, she was talking to me for a bit. And I said, Mindy, are you okay? And she's like, oh, I did this sun run with my daughter yesterday. And she was kind of like hobbling a little bit. And she's like, I really hurt my knee. She did the 10K sun run. So, and she hadn't trained very much with her, for it with her daughter. Anyway, so, um, you know, she kind of keeps talking to me and doing her thing. And um, I had this like Holy Spirit conviction in my heart that I'm like, if I don't offer to pray for her, I'm like disobedient. And so I like, oh, like, oh, 
my heart was beating and I was really nervous, but I asked if I could pray for her and she like just started tearing up and she was crying. And I just put my hand on her knee and I said, in Jesus' name, like everything be healed, the muscles and tendons and whatever it was, you know, go back to the place in Jesus' name. And she just like felt this, she said she felt this heat and tingling going through her legs. And I'm thinking to myself like, she's got to be joking. <laughs> like I was very shocked. And then and I was like, okay, we'll try it. Does it feel like 100% better? And she's like, not quite, but it's way better. And she was feeling this heat and tingling. So I prayed one more time and then it was 100% at the end. And I was just like, that was, the, I think that was probably the first time I had prayed for someone and Jordan wasn't there. Because usually he'll say, oh, my wife wants to pray for you. <laughs> yeah. so, um, this was like God speaking to me and me stepping out in faith and praying for this lady, and she was healed by God. So that was really um, exciting. And I've had some gospel conversations with her since then, but she's more, uh, she's not quite there yet. And the recording cut out for this part of the teaching, but uh, basically I read out a Chuck Swindle quote. Uh, from his email ministry, uh, somebody who had sent me this and wanted me to reply to it about um, what Chuck Swindle claims is God's will towards healing. So if you just read this and then we'll get into teaching on it. How well do you accept the unfolding plan of God for your life? So um, they are quite disturbed with this uh, quote saying, It'd be God's plan for somebody for their whole life to have Lou Gehrig's disease. And Job is a, a great example of this, how we can be called to a life of pain, and that's God's will. Okay, so, and they say, if you don't believe this, then you're not believing the Bible. So there's a lot of um, strange doctrines out there and things that people have been taught that actually hold them back from healing. Uh, that uh, Let's get into God's will for healing, okay? And um, you know, we'll get into the story of Job there to see uh, what insights we can get from the story of Job, that it might actually be the very opposite message from the story of Job. But um, anyway, so God's will for healing. Okay, what is God's will? Uh, we can very strongly, first of all, I just wanted to give a very overview of the whole Bible, okay? Uh, God's character and will can be seen through the Bible. Just if we give a broad stroke of the whole Bible, what's God's will towards, uh, does he want us to be sick for a whole life, or just does he, is his will for healing? Okay, so in the very beginning, when God creates the heavens and the earth, let's look at the beginning first, right? When he creates Adam and Eve, does he create them immediately with a disease? Mm -hmm. No, but he actually puts them on an earth where there's no pain or suffering, or even no death. And he, that's his perfect will to begin with. His will is for uh, wholeness. And, uh, and with this is, we strongly see his will right from the beginning. And um, we see what happens very quickly is the fall, right? Um, Adam and Eve fall into sin. And then the consequence of that immediately is some tough things, right? Adam's going to have to work from the sweat of his brow. Eve's going to have pain and childbearing. Right away now, when Adam and Eve go off track, now we see a different story where now we're seeing uh, pain, sickness, disease. So, but we see God's original will wasn't for that, right? And then as we keep going on in the Bible, I just kind of summarized very briefly the creation story in Genesis. But as we head next into Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, Genesis, Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy, Got to get better at that kid's song about all the books. As we get into the book of Deuteronomy, we see where sickness and diseases come from. So as we go to Deuteronomy 28, there's quite a, there's a, so there's a short list of all the blessings that will come upon people for obeying God. Will be health, will be uh, your crops doing well, will be uh, success. So in obeying God, all these really good things, prospering, your health prospering. But then we see about probably 40 verses about all the curses and health problems that will come upon people when they don't obey God's ways. So in Deuteronomy 28, and I'm just going to, 
Okay, just I'll go to verse 15. So uh, this is for now if you get into disobedience like Adam did. However, if you do not obey the Lord your God and do not carefully follow all his commands and decrees I'm giving you today, all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. You'll be cursed in the city and cursed in the country. Your basket and your kneading trowel will be cursed. The fruit of your womb will be cursed. And the crops of your land and the calves of your herds and the lambs of your flocks. You'll be cursed when you come in and cursed when you go out. The Lord will send on you curses, confusion, and rebuke in everything you put your hand to until you're destroyed and come to sudden ruin because of the evil you've done in forsaking him. The Lord will plague you with diseases until he has destroyed you from the land you're entering to possess. The Lord will strike you with wasting disease, with fever, and inflammation. This is one we just dealt with last night, inflammation, with some of the uh, received healing. Uh, with scorching heat and drought, with blight and mildew, which will plague you until you perish. And so it goes on and on for probably about 50 verses of all the curses that will come upon us for disobedience. So God's perfect will is healing, but humanity and trusting the devil has brought in a lot of curses. Okay, so we're going to get into how those curses got reversed, how they can reverse on a person's life, even if you've done a whole bunch of these sins and brought all these curses in your life, they can be reversed. Every curse can be reversed. Uh, but I just want to jump to the very end of the Bible again to see God's, per God's will. Okay, so we saw it at the very beginning was His will for healing and health. And then at the very end, those who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ and the blood of Jesus, where do they end up? In the heavenly place, right? Where there will be no uh, pain and suffering and sicknesses. So we see at the very beginning his will, we see at the very end of the Bible his will, we see in the middle a lot of, um, you know, badly for people trying, obeying him, but at the beginning and end we see his will very strongly. Okay, now all of these curses, if you walked in sin and you had all these curses upon your life, how do you get free of these, right? It's, in, it's impossible to get free of them. Unless you have Jesus who took every curse upon himself. So we see that at the cross. Um, and we saw that last night. So I'll just tell a quick story. That um, we had a woman come for prayer last night. Um, Dan and I prayed for her. But for months she was trying to get to our house to receive prayer. And uh, we would run into her. And, and she'd be like, I really want you guys to pray for me. I know I need deliverance from demons and I need healing, I want prayer. And so we'd be like, yeah, come at this place at this time, come to our house then and there. And it was literally like every time we'd want to pray for her, something would come up or she'd forget or for some reason always prevented from receiving prayer for months. And then until finally last night, we had to set the time, yeah, Friday at 8 o'clock, because I ran into her two days ago again and said Friday. And so I was shocked when she showed up at our house. I just totally forgot about it myself because I was expecting she wouldn't show up, and she did. And so um, when we, before even praying for for healing, okay, she wanted healing for uh, fibromyalgia. I'm struggling with pronouncing tonight. Fibromyalgia. 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 Yeah. Inflammation throughout the whole body, and especially down the back and down her whole legs, like chronic 24/7 kind of pain. We're talking. Uh, asthma was another thing she mentioned and just some battles in life right? she's got battles so we didn't immediately pray for her though to be healed okay we didn't immediately just be healed in Jesus name we got we just first wanted to cover some basis on uh, where she at and if there's a whole bunch of curses upon a person's life maybe let's come out of agreement with the curses first so we just said to her um, hey like your previous religion, so she used to be a Sikh. Ten years ago, she became Christian, and then we found out she's basically never asked God to forgive her of like any of the main sins in her life. Nobody led her through that. They just said, "Yeah, I'd say the sinner's prayer, get baptized, just keep coming to church." That was kind of how they led her to Christ, but never like, "Hey, maybe let's say sorry for bowing down to demonic gods for twenty years." 
So she never said sorry about any sin. So we got to be the first people after 10 years of her trying to follow Jesus to uh, say, God, forgive me. So they did this um, ritual. It's not actually part of the Sikh faith, but they get into other spiritualism because there's no power in the Sikh God, right? So they seek other spiritual powers. So uh, with her um, friends and family, they get together every Thursday night to worship a God, a lowercase God, right? But they literally come in and they had some kind of like, I don't know, yellow light thing. And they, they come in and you had to bring like food and you'd have to give some kind of offering of, of food to the God and bow down to it. And they do this every Thursday and, and, and they would tell her like, this is very serious. Like you have to come every Thursday. If you don't, all kinds of evil stuff is going to happen to you. Your life's going to fall apart. So she was in fear of having to come and worship this God every week on a Thursday. And I can't remember the name of the God. It was so strange. But uh, we just said, okay, well, let's, uh, you know, she's literally never said sorry to God or forgive me. Okay. So if you, conf if you did a sin, you should, like, if you did a sin individually, you should confess it individually. Okay. So that's a word for a uh, few people here that you have sins from your past. You've never confessed to God. And you should, and you'll be freed and uh, find freedom through confessing them, okay? And you only have to, so she was like, so then she's like, okay, I just confessed it now. Should I do that tomorrow and like kind of do it every day to keep, we were like, no, you just do it once. That's the power of the blood of Jesus that you just confess a sin once and the curse is reversed and you're forgiven. Isn't that powerful? Even though she bowed down to that God thousands of times, she doesn't have to say sorry to God now thousands of times. That's powerful. That's the power of the blood of Jesus. So we said, no, it's just once. And we said, actually, tomorrow you say, forgive me again. You're actually showing unbelief that you're forgiven. Mm -hmm. If you're instantly forgiven when you confess it, and then the next day you keep saying sorry, keep saying sorry. Imagine, like, you know, my son uh, spills milk all over the floor, right? And then he genuinely says, Daddy, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I made that mess. Okay. The next, and I say, yeah, I forgive you, son. The next day, if he comes to say sorry again, you're like, uh, yeah, we dealt with that, man. That was yesterday. That was yesterday, Jeff said. I like, come on, let's get over it. Right? So anyways, um, we only have to confess a sin once, and it's forgiven. So that's a powerful thing. Um, so anyways, we, we got her to confess a whole bunch of sins uh, where she had done uh, fortune telling, palm reading, occult practices. So especially occult practices, these kinds of things, bowing down to the gods, they're going to bring curses on a life, and a, and a curse often comes with a sickness or a disease. And so who has taken them upon himself? Jesus took upon himself all of the curses that that woman had brought into her life. And so then we prayed for her. Once we had dealt with uh, getting all these curses lifted off of her, uh, then we prayed for her. And it was really powerful um, that we, we, yeah, as we prayed, she just said, I just feel so light, like light in my mind. And then we got her to stand up and walk. And she was like, all the pain in my back is totally gone. And then, uh, so then, but she said the pain's still down in my legs. So then Dan prays for her again. And then all the pain leaves back, down the back of her legs. And so this woman really uh, was powerfully touched by the Lord yesterday, last night. And then what did she text you when she woke up this morning? Uh, she said she woke up, well, she had one attack this morning, but we told her, you know, the devil put her back on it, so she didn't get, so she rebuked it. She was glad the Lord felt like it was like light as a feather getting out of bed. So she felt light as a feather getting out of bed. And we pre-warned her that the devil might come back to try to, uh, like, put a symptom on her. That she'd say, oh, I guess I'm not healed. Oh, I guess it's just always going to be a part of my life. Uh, like, the, you know, he's going to come to try to uh, get her to receive it again. So we pre prompted her on that, and it kind of did happen. And then, But then uh, she's kept standing in faith. So we're going to keep uh, battling, helping her battle for her uh, for her healing there. To keep, keep going strong. So... Um, Anyways, but she got uh, freed from a demon and and uh, the healing that happened. Mm -hmm. And uh, so we, I looked at the God's will at the beginning of the Bible. Looked at God's will at the end of the Bible. And what about the best part uh, 
on this book of Marks, we have the question. We wanted to make them not look too religious, like the Holy Bible, but we put on the front, uh, what's black and white and the best part's red? So usually it says, you know, what's black and white and red all over? And you yeah. call the newspaper, huh? But we said, and, what, what's, and, and the best part's red. So if we go to the, or the red letters, the middle of the Bible, or the life of Jesus, um, we see the perfect will of the Father. When we see Jesus, we see the Father's will, right? He says, I only do what the Father tells him. And so when we see Jesus walk around, what's, uh, what happens? We really see God's will towards healing, right? That everywhere he goes, people are healed of sicknesses. Mm -hmm. And um, some people will push back then, oh, actually, no, not everywhere he went was everybody healed. Um, but I'm just going to read one quote about Jesus healing all over the place. So in Matthew 8, and then verse 16. Uh, when evening came, many who were demon-possessed were brought to him, and he drove out the spirits with a word, and healed some of the sick. Uh, he healed all the sick, he says. This was to fulfill what was spoken through the prophet Isaiah. I took up, he took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. And took, sorry, he took up our infirmities and carried our diseases. So Jesus took them upon himself on the cross. And it says he healed all the sick. So he went from time to time, he healed all the sick. But people say, no, you see, it's God, God's will is not for healing because there was a town Jesus went to and not many people were healed. So, you know, God, Jesus couldn't heal the people there, they'll say. So if you just look at that story of Jesus, it's when he goes to his hometown, right? And it, it does say not many were healed there. So were not many healed because it wasn't God's will or because mm -hmm. Jesus wasn't powerful enough? Mm -hmm. Uh, so if you look at the stories of other towns he goes to, he shows up at a town, and what it says, it says that, and the people brought all the sick people to him to lay hands on them, and they were even cutting holes in the roof to get the sick to Jesus. The people had radical faith that if I just touch him, I'm going to be healed. So what happens when he goes to his hometown that not many are healed? Is it because he doesn't have the power? No, it's because the people don't have the faith to actually bring the sick to him. They're not, they don't have the faith to bring the sick to him. So that's why not many people get healed. Oh, that's just the carpenter. That's just Joseph's son. We know him. We don't need to go to him. So uh, that's the only place where, uh, where we see not as many people healed. Okay, because of a lack of faith. Uh, so did Jesus ever uh, reject somebody for healing? Well, he tried to once. Tried to uh, say no to somebody, right? A woman comes to him and says, My daughter is demonized. Can you uh, set her free? And Jesus says, No, this, this, is, this is the children's bread. So he says, This is only for those of Israel, right? Because she's not an Israelite. Um, but he says, This is the children's bread. I don't give dogs what is sacred. I'm paraphrasing it. But she says, But even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from the master's table. And then Jesus is just amazed by her faith and persistence. And then he says, okay, it is done. And within that hour, the, the girl, his daughter, or her daughter is free. So we do see one time he tried to not bring healing to someone, but still he had such mercy and love that he'd still extend his hand to heal. So in the person of Jesus, we cannot deny that he went around doing good works and uh, under the power of the Holy Spirit and destroying the works of the devil, is what it says. Okay, so the will of God for healing, we're, we're seeing a lot of it. Now, I'm going to jump back now to, uh, what's it? I'm just going to get into a couple pushbacks people have about God's will towards healing. Okay. Um, so the first one is, okay, it, it's Chuck Swindle. <laughs> Chuck Swindle was the quote. That's why I was kind of shocked because he's like a really well-known teacher, right? Just because someone's well-known doesn't mean much. Um, I'm going to go back to the Chuck Swindle uh, comment about in Job's life, we see, basically we see God's will that he wants people to be sick for the rest of their life. I'm paraphrasing Chuck Swindle here, but let's just look at the story of Job, okay? So... The story of Job, who is it that causes the sickness in Job's life? 
So Satan. Again, right? Satan. Satan. Okay, it's not God, but it's Satan. Okay. So I'm already struggling with that quote from Chuck Swindle. That Satan is the one who goes to God and he asks for permission. Imagine he has to go and ask for permission. But he goes and asks for permission, and, and God actually has enough faith in Job's uh, strength in him that he says, Yeah, go and you can test him. He's going to stand strong, you can test him. And uh, God allows for that to happen. Um, now, Satan's the one that brings the sickness in that situation. And does Job, like here it says, you know, maybe Lou Gehrig's disease is God's will for someone's whole life because of Job's scenario. Does Job keep being sick for the rest of his life? No, he got double what he had. No, in fact, amen. Yeah. He get not only healed, but double portions of what he had before that. So you're destroying what's being said here. Like literally, uh, God's will for Job was to double prosper him in the end. So it says, you know, he says here, God doesn't have a wonderful plan for everybody's life. Like he had a wonderful plan for Job. Job got a whole 40 chapters in the Bible written about him. Like in James, it says he's, um, people are amazed from his perseverance. It's like there's a crown of glory over Job. And so, um, you know, there was a short time where he was sick and God allowed for that to happen. But was that God's plan for him for the rest of his life? No, right? So I hope you know God as a father. And like I was talking to Melissa, right? Uh, with my son, Josiah. Wouldn't that be a really weird father that would want your son to have a sickness for the whole rest of his life? And like that would be my will for his life? It's like, no. But you know, I have inflicted pain on my son the odd time. <laughs> And it wasn't because I want him to have that pain the rest of his life, but it was for a short season for a long-term growth, you know? Mm -hmm. uh, what's that saying in the working out world? Uh, short-term pain for long-term gain, mm -hmm. okay? So I have given my son a little psh, psh, from time to time, and I inflict a short little pain, but it's for a long-term gain, and my will is just that he'll be obedient, and he'll follow the ways of God. And so, uh, you know, God allows, uh, Satan to go in there, little testing, little trial over Job, but long term for uh, a mighty, mighty blessing. So, I don't know how we get from this story, this story of Job, that it's God's will for people to be sick the rest of their life. Um, I wish that, you know, you know, there was people that came along Job while he was suffering and suffering. At first, they were doing a good job just kind of being quiet and letting him process it. But then they started to critique him. Hey, it must be because of a sin. It must be. That was a genuine concern. Like they were onto something there. That it, if there was a sin in Job's life, then that could be why he had a sickness. According to Deuteronomy 28, you know, if he had you know done palm reading the week before, then that would make sense that you're sick. So they were trying trying to probe to get to the root of the issue. But Job was righteous, right? You know, there was no sin causing that sickness. There was no sin behind it. So um, they didn't really have eyes to see these guys that sat down with Job by the tree. They were questioning Job, you know, pointing the finger at Job. But, and then a lot of the Christian church world nowadays, who do they point the finger at? They point the finger at God. And you know why? Does God allows sickness and wants us sick. They point the finger at God. Did anybody that sat down beside, in that tree beside Job, did anyone point at the devil? I don't think anywhere in that story did somebody say, I wonder if the devil's behind this. Nobody even came to that conclusion. Okay? So, um, it says, you know, then in the book of Acts, that Jesus went around destroying the works of the devil. Okay? So, just getting at kind of where sickness comes from. Okay? Oftentimes, we see in the word, it's from the devil. So the other pushback people often have about God's will for healing is uh, the story of, probably the most common one after that is the story of Paul uh, in 2 Corinthians 12, where he had a, a thorn in his flesh, right? So people, um, this happens often where uh, Christians have a sickness or disease, and they'll say, it's my cross to bear. This is my cross to bear. God gave me this, and I have to have it the rest of my life. Okay. So I would say that God would allow someone to have a sickness for a season that hopefully pretty quickly they realize they need to maybe repent of something, 
or like he'll use it for a good purpose in the end, but it's not like long term, he wants the person to be sick the rest of their life. But anyways, people will often point to this one as a, a something of, that God wants people to be sick, okay? That is his will for people to be sick. From, they base it on Paul here. So, Second uh, Corinthians 11, starting verse 7. So, to keep me from becoming conceited because of these surpassingly great revelations, there was given me a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan, to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But he said to me, My grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Therefore, I will boast all the more gladly about my weaknesses, so that Christ's power may rest on me. That is why, for Christ's sake, I delight in weaknesses, in insults, in hardships, in persecutions, in difficulties. For when I am weak, then I am strong. Alright, so then, yeah, people will really um, almost embrace a sickness as their identity, um, based off of this passage. Uh, rather than continuing in faith that God would want to heal me, they would embrace it more like God wants me to be sick. Okay, um, so just first of all, I want to ask again, with Job, the sickness came from Satan, right? Where is it? So a lot of people say, God has given me this, it's my cross to bear. Where does this, just this thorn in the flesh with Paul, who sends it? It says, a uh, messenger of Satan in verse seven. Okay, so, I've had the odd Christian tell me that God gave me this sickness according to this passage, and I'll say, well, according to that passage, uh, Satan sent the sickness, so you're going to at least have to change who sent it to you if you want to believe your sickness is based on this chapter. You'll at least have to not give the credit to God, but point it to Satan, okay? Um, but then also, uh, people will assume that this is talking about a sickness, okay? So... Uh, he, because he calls it a thorn in my flesh. All right, now there's a whole bunch of debate about these words, but basically a thorn in my flesh, quite a few times in the Old Testament, this same term is used. Um, women use it a lot today, like my husband's being a thorn in my flesh. <laughs> okay, possibly. Uh, some saying like that, right? Uh, my wife doesn't say that. But, you know, so a thorn in my flesh. Um, in the Old Testament, it is also used about other countries, like the Philistines are going to be a thorn in your flesh, or uh, you know that country over there, they're going to be a thorn in your flesh. You know, if you allow their gods and you worship their gods, they're going to be a thorn in your flesh. So it was oftentimes used as like uh, people coming to cause a problem in your life, or or a persecution coming at you. Okay, now in the context of this, pretty much the whole chapter before, Paul's talking about boasting about all his sufferings and persecutions that have come to him, and then he gets into talking about this thorn in his flesh, okay? So, to conclude that this was a health problem that Paul was dealing with, it, it, there's, you know, not a, necessarily a strong evidence to even suggest this was a, a health problem he was dealing with. And, um... Also, later on when he says, like, what I boast about, he doesn't say I boast about my sickness. He says, I'll boast about my weakness uh, in, the, in verse 10. Uh, I delight in weaknesses, insults, hardships, persecutions, difficulties. When I'm weak, then I'm strong. So he re-emphasizes that are the persecutions and trials he's going through. But it doesn't necessarily that he says, I rejoice in my sicknesses, but more in the weaknesses or the attacks he's facing. Um, so, to conclude from here that, uh, you know, especially that it's just out of one person's situation in the Bible, you know, to look at one snare in the Bible and then make a whole theology around God's will, uh, just that alone would be kind of off track. That would be like saying, you know, uh, Ananias and Sapphira were struck dead because of the sin, so that must be God's will for anybody that sins, you know, that we get struck down. It's like, no, that was like a, you know, a scenario that happened, but doesn't mean it's God's will for every person, right? So, anyways, to, to base your whole understanding of God's will off of this one story, where it's not even super clear what the issue was, 
but more likely it's pointing towards the persecutions he was facing. But I just bring this one up because a lot of people, this holds them back from believing in God's will for healing. So we see all throughout scriptures, you know, the one time somebody comes to Jesus and says, uh, they question Jesus' will to heal. Okay, I'm going to go back to Matthew 8. People come to him and they, they want to be healed, but they kind of come in a questioning uh, motion. So at the beginning, I'll start at the beginning of Matthew 8. When he came down from the mountainside, large crowds followed him. A man with leprosy came and knelt before him and said, Lord, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So he says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So uh, in my upbringing, religious upbringing, I heard a lot of prayers that were like this. Uh, God, if it's your will, would you heal this person? So it's a, a questioning of God's will before asking for something. Okay. Um, this is where it's really important to get a get a, your, your correct view on God and his, and his character especially, that uh, it's his will for healing. Because uh, if you already know his will, then you can walk in his will. Okay, but if you're questioning, wavering whether God even likes or wants to heal people, then you're not even going to pray for a sick person. And if you do, you're not going to have much faith. So that's why I'm teaching this, that you need to know it's God's will to heal. Because if you don't, not really sure, yeah, you're probably not even going to pray for the person. But when you do pray for them, you want to know that it's his will and exercise his will. So we don't see anywhere in the Bible that somebody prayed like that. God, if it's your will, like if you just look at outside of Jesus, you look at Paul, he'd be talking to a group like this, and then he'd say, you, you see that they had faith and healed, and he said, get up. So he'd do it, he'd speak a command. Uh, he wouldn't say, God, if it's your will, could you get that person to get up? No, he knew it's God's will to heal that man, and he'd say, rise up, get up. So this person here says, Lord, if you are willing, you can make me clean. So they're not fully sure about if it'll be his will. Maybe everyone else, God wants to heal, but not me. Okay. Uh, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. Immediately he was cured of his leprosy. Then Jesus said to him, see that you don't tell anyone, but go show yourself to the priest and offer the gift Moses commanded as a testimony to them. Okay, so God's will for healing, for uh, you to be uh, fully saved, healed, delivered, that um, his will is to, um, number one, his will is for you to have intimacy with him, relationship with him, to love him. So if you're not loving him and, and there's not a good relationship, he might let you go through a trial to pull you back in line, okay? But his, his, the trial is not his ultimate will. Uh, his ultimate will is you getting back in line with him. His number one will is that he, you know, we have a body, soul, spirit. According to Thessalonians 5.23, it says, uh, May your whole body, soul, and spirit be kept blameless at the coming of the Lord Jesus Christ. So may your whole body, soul, and spirit. So. I believe that God's number one will is for the health of your spirit, and then your soul, and then your body. Okay, so he does want all to be healed, but if something's off in your spirit, he's not gung-ho to just immediately always want to heal your body. He first wants to deal with your spirit and your soul. So that's why with that lady that came from that Sikh background that we prayed for, we first addressed her spirit-soul issues. She had to forgive people too, it was a big thing. If you have people you haven't forgiven in life, literally you're signing a contract with the devil saying you can keep tormenting me. Mm -hmm. uh, Jesus talks about that, right? If you don't forgive, you won't be forgiven. So, number one, God wants to, his number one will is to heal your spirit, and then your soul, and then your body. So, for me, he has like a, uh, I don't know if that's called triage. What is it? <laughs> What's triage? Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> it's like, first go to the floor where your spirit gets healed. Like on floor three in the hospital, Jesus hospital, then floor two is for your soul and for your body. Yeah. Okay, so uh, he might let your body uh, go through a trial in order for you to actually press towards God. I just tell you guys a story about how I got healed of COVID. You interested? Okay, I, I, I don't know if I had COVID, but I had all the symptoms they talk about. 
and didn't have much energy, uh, fever for, I think it was going on into the 10th day. Then I thought to myself, like, I don't, I, I definitely wasn't planning on going to a hospital to get some uh, death certificate. <laughs> but um, I, I thought, okay, we're going into 10 days here. Um, maybe I should actually obey the Bible and what you do when you're sick. So what should we do when we're sick? This is very important. This is a life and death situation I'm talking about. It could be in a year from now that nobody's allowed to go to the hospital. So might as well just make that rule for yourself now. But um, let's get into James 5. Uh, it says uh, what to do when you're sick. Okay, and I waited 10 days and didn't do this. So, and it's all good. I wanted to first get healed just on my own faith, just direct to the Lord. Okay, but after 10 days, I was like, maybe I'll go to step two, what the Bible says. Is any one of you in trouble? He should pray. Is anyone happy? Let him sing songs of praise. Is any one of you sick? He should call the elders of the church to pray over him and anoint him with oil. In the name of the Lord, and the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. Therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you may be healed. Okay, so then I went to Dan here and said, all right, Dan, can you anoint me and my wife that have had this COVID for 10 days? And uh, while he prayed for us, I felt I was supposed to confess a sin. Um, and it was, uh, what came to my mind was an issue I was having where sometimes I would, um, should I, is that okay to tell him? Sometimes I would uh, say to myself in my head this really twisted, perverted thought that, well, if my wife died, then I could marry someone else. Like, I love my wife, she's amazing. And yeah, this, this thought would keep coming into my mind like that. And I felt like I was to confess that as a sin. Um, it's kind of like coveting, right? Or a, a, a lust or whatever. So I felt like I was supposed to confess that and I didn't. And, uh, but the next day I was feeling pretty good. Like I was being healed until the next night came around. And it was like this crazy intense re-attack that came over me, like worse than all the 10 days before. Like this huge pounding headache. And it was just like, oh man, what is going on here? Like, and I had, it was like, I was, and I was just, and just this voice, you didn't confess that sin, man. So that, I sometimes, that's how God spoke. So I just rushed to uh, as quick as I could to Dan, and I was just desperate now to confess this sin. Before I was like, ah, it's probably, I probably don't have to confess. And now I was like desperate to confess it. Okay, so sometimes God will let some kind of difficulty come for the greater good, right? I confessed it to him, and it was the, one of the most strongest experiences I guess I've had. Uh, it was really powerful. I can't. Literally, as I told him it, it was like I felt this pounding, crazy thing just lift off me, and I was just completely 100% healed of the COVID and all of that stuff. From the, it was, it was just like exact when I confessed it all. Like, so praise God. So um, that's why we even came here tonight that we want to um, obey this command for for those people here that want to be healed and want to uh, put their faith in these words. It, it, this, literally, the faith that's being called to here is um, the prayer offered in faith will make the sick person well. This is a promise that's given to you. And let's say you get prayed for tonight and you don't feel healed. This literally says you will, it, the prayer of faith will make the sick person well. The Lord will raise him up. If he has sinned, he'll be forgiven. So there is a call or a condition here, too. It says, therefore, confess your sins to each other and pray for each other so that you'll be healed. So we have seen a number of times where, yeah, um, when somebody confessing something, they're healed. Yeah. So God's will is for healing. And uh, have, let's have our mind renewed into that, into his will for healing. Yeah, he's good. Mm -hmm. So we want to uh, pray for people tonight. And uh, um, let's see. Just put up your hand if you want to be healed tonight. Do you want prayer for healing? Okay. 
Christina, when did you want to be healed? There's a pain in your chest. There's a pain in your chest. Okay. Do you have that right now? Okay. We'll show an example, praying for Christina. And, um, Bernard, do you want to come pray for Christina? Okay. So, let's just, let's just, Bernard has a lot of faith, okay? I, I do believe she believes the word, and it says, says in the word, as I've just described, it's God's will to heal. So, when she comes and prays, she doesn't have to question God's will. It's like, let's just say Christina was, you can start coming up. Let's say Christina was speeding on the highway, okay, and, and Berna was a police officer, okay, and she comes and pulls her over. You were speeding, she says, okay. Now, um, she's going to give a ticket to Christina, right? Now, she doesn't have to phone the sheriff's department to phone her boss, the chief of police, and she'll go out and ask, hey, chief, is it your will that I give a speeding ticket to Christina? Like, she doesn't have to phone the boss to ask if it's his will, but the boss would be like, why are you asking me such a silly question? Like, I gave you a badge, I gave you a gun, and I told you to go and give speeding tickets. So why are you asking me if that's my will? Okay, that would be a, an example, okay? So when we go to pray for someone, she already knows the will of the chief of police, so she already knows God's will. So then uh, now she's going to pray knowing God's will. Yeah? Wait, wait, did I repent first? Uh, something to do with this. So I've been dealing with a lot of anger and just, um, I, re I tried to do things on my own way and not God's way. So I'm repenting that and know that I was wrong and I did, did, not, did not need to yell and call somebody a liar and I was wrong. Sometimes, like, if you're, let's just say you're praying for someone. Sometimes it's good to pre-check, almost like a doctor would. Like, what's your pain out of 10? 10 is the worst ever in life. What was your pain, though, before we pray? Eight. Eight out of 10. Okay. You want to pray again, then, Bernie? 10 is 10. 10 is like you're giving birth to pain. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you're So, yeah, we pray more than once uh, for you people that you want to heal the sick, right? Wanting to equip believers. Jesus once prayed for a blind man. The first time he prays for the blind man, the guy says, I see trees that are, like, moving. So, Jesus actually, Jesus himself prays more than once, right? So how much more should we pray at least twice? Jesus did. And then he sees, oh, it's people walking that I'm seeing. So... That's why Burn is praying more than more than once here. Yeah, we'll pray again. All trust in you. Go. I command you to go in Jesus' name. Go right now. And that's a complete healing. Complete healing in Jesus' name. Thank you. Been free from anger and this 